Welcome to the Social Museum. Thank you very much for coming. Um, today we're going to talk about how museums can be more social using social media. I'm Sarah Bailey Hogarty, and I'm with the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, which are the de Young and the Legion of Honor. I'm Kathy Joller from the Contemporary Jewish Museum. And hi, everybody. I'm Willa Kerner. I'm from the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Um, and the way the talk is going to be structured today, um, so the, there are three sections that are going to be kind of a compilation of case studies and true tales. Um, but it, we're going to talk about how social media tools have kind of changed the way we interact, uh, museum to audience, museum to museum, and then the museum to itself. And we'll also be using this hashtag MuseSocial instead of the hashtag um, that's printed in the uh, MCM. Can you use the mic? Oh, sorry. In, we're going to be using the Muse social hashtag instead of the one printed in the um, pamphlet that you have because we're hoping to garner a larger online audience outside of the conference and break open this form of communication. Um, we also have a special guest joining us today. Um, we've telecommuted, teleconferenced in. <laughs> <laughs> Teleported. <laughs> Teleported through uh, the internet. Um, the online uh, anonymous personality museum nerd who you, many of you may be familiar with. And um, Museum Nerd will be moderating our Q&A's online component through Twitter for the last half hour where we will be asking our um, audience here to contribute questions and also pulling from the Twitter conversation as well. So I'm going to kick it off with our museum to audience section. Um, I've been with the de Young and the Legion of Honor for about six years now. And I originally started out as the curatorial assistant for the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas. But in early 2011, I was brought into the office of the chief curator um, to head up digital media initiatives, including social media. And at the time that I came on, um, our social media presence rested firmly within the marketing department. Um, and in that iteration was basically comprised of telling our audience what to see, when and where to see it, and how much it cost. It's pretty engaging stuff. So there's little to no actual engagement going on. There was no dialogue, no questioning, no solicitation of user-generated input or content. Um, and in this context, I immediately recognized a palpable distrust of our online audience, which obviously limited substantive engagement that we could uh, cultivate between the museums and our followers. So over the next year, I slowly began to chip away at this major uh, barrier to engagement that was coming from our end. Um, I began to post a few questions here and there or submitted links about um, fun and interesting subject matter that didn't necessarily relate explicitly back to our exhibitions. And slowly but surely, I began to garner um, a clearer view of what our audiences were engaging with, what interests them, what would incentivize them to interact with us on a deeper level. And as many of you probably know, this is, a, this is a moving target. And trying to figure out what our audiences react to or against is, is constantly evolving. Um, so early 2012 was a really exciting time at the de Young because we were opening up this mega exhibition, The Fashion World of Jean-Paul Gaultier from the sidewalk to the, uh, excuse me, from the sidewalk to the catwalk. And Jean-Paul Gaultier is a veritable rock star of the fashion world. Um, and you all most likely know him for introducing the world to the cone bra, which Madonna famously wore in her 1990 um, Blonde Ambition tour. And this show is going to be epic, a huge multimedia extravaganza with tons of digital media, multiple LCD screens, blasting runway shows, MTV era videos film clips featuring Gauthier's extensive costume work, and um, most notably, talking mannequins with digital projections actually mapped onto their faces. And it was all going to kick off with a huge party called Le Grand Fête, at which the um, designer himself would be in attendance that was organized by our development team. And so they approached me to request some social media coverage of this party. And I immediately recognized that this would be a perfect opportunity to um, initiate an, an engagement campaign. Um, but I had no idea how to go about organizing it. So during that same period, it was around February, um, I had been enviously, I will admit, um, lurking on SF MoMA's Facebook page and watching their wonderful engagement campaign, which is about, a, it was called a love letter to art and soliciting user-generated content. And they were really coming up with some wonderful stuff. So 
I set up a meeting with Willa to pick her brain, that Willa right there, and um, to talk to her about how she had overcome this barrier of engagement and had really been able to solicit some wonderful content from her users. And Willa gave me some great tips, which I will share with you here today. Um, first off, you really need to allow plenty of time to promote your campaign. Um, you can't expect a lot of engagement, let alone meaningful engagement, if you only give your users like one day to post something. Um, and you can provide in these promotional posts inspirational pictures or links um, that sort of illustrate what you're looking for from your users. Um, definitely ask your creative-minded friends and or your coworkers to help you get the ball rolling. Um, and it is social media after all, and people are more likely to get involved if other people are doing it. And in the same vein, aggregate several posts before you um, actually post it out live, because there's safety in numbers. So you don't expose a single user. You sort of put them into a nice, a nice group of, of all the cool kids that are doing it. Uh, you definitely want to provide a very clearly articulated place to which your users can submit their content. Um, for me, this included working with my IT department to generate a public-facing email, since I didn't really want to put my personal work email out there. Um, and then the other thing you need to think about is keeping it simple. Um, I think when we when soliciting user-generated content, it really makes a lot of sense to draw from content they've probably already made. Um, in my experience, I've found that when you're asking users to create artwork or to build out something specifically based on your prompt, you're probably going to get fewer submissions. Um, so it's definitely great to create campaigns that tap into a body of work that they probably already have on hand. And although ideally not necessary for every campaign, it always helps to have a really great prize for the best, most creative, most art artistic submission. And in this case, we're offering um, two winners each a pair of tickets to attend uh, the La Grande Fête party. And with each ticket individually purchase, uh, costing $150, this was certainly not insignificant in value. So with these helpful guidelines in place, I set out to design an engagement campaign, campaign that reflected Jean-Paul Gaultier's design ethos, which is defined by the celebration of all body and beauty types, as well as sort of a DIY punk sensibility. Um, so we asked users to submit their most creative Jean-Paul Gaultier-inspired look. And I've done these campaigns now a couple of times, and just like I felt about 20 minutes ago in this giant empty conference room, you know, you always feel like the, the sort of lone party host sitting in your empty house with a packed smorgasbord full of food, certain that nobody's going to come. But they do. And so that first week, we received about four or five submissions, which I posted as a single album, again, to aggregate content to not single out any one user. And after that, the floodgates really flew open. Now, this being San Francisco, I was pretty sure I was going to get a lot of Burning Man, Burning Man style DIY get-ups, but what actually happened was really interesting. And at first, we definitely did get some of the more handmade, costumey style um, creations, such as these two very brave girls who posted out this picture. And as you can see from the comment thread and the likes, um, this image sparked a really lively con conversation. But what was really interesting about the conversation that it was that it organically addressed all of the exhibition's main um, thesis points. So this comment thread is really the best we could have hoped for in as much as our audience began to organically discuss the exhibition based on content they had provided. Um, and in this way, the Facebook, uh, the De Young's Facebook page provided a forum for, uh, for our audience with multiple reference points, opinions, knowledge levels. Um, and they were all engaging with each other's content, with each other, and in so doing, we're really touching on the museum's main messaging. Um, this is also a great example of what can happen when you trust your audience, because clearly some of the comments initially were a little bit mean-spirited, but one of, another user immediately stepped in and they began to self-regulate, and in so doing, furthered the conversation and really got us um, back on track to discussing what was that, you know, the exhibition at hand. 
So as the contest progressed and its outreach extended um, to more users, the, the submissions became increasingly sophisticated. So um, I began to receive really high quality entries from local fashion designers. This fashion designer was incidentally Elena, most notably seen recently on uh, Project Runway, you may recognize that. Um, photographers, stylists, and hairstylists. And they all wanted to showcase how Jean-Paul Gaultier had um, inspired their work. So this was totally unexpected and a welcomed elevation of the content that, again, directly addressed the exhibition's primary themes and even got some really cool press coverage. So the heightened level of uh, user-generated content also inspired us to ask um, Jean-Paul Gaultier himself to judge the contest. And thankfully, he agreed. And uh, this added an additional layer of really meaningful engagement, wherein we, the museum, were providing an avenue, a channel of communication for these young up-and-coming designers to speak with an um, industry giant, um, with the designer himself. So um, thankfully, he, he did select two um, independent designers on your right here, or Sorry, yeah, you're right. And, um, and then both designers were able to come to the party and wear their um, creations or bring a model with them who was wearing their creations. And so this represented a really cool conversion of online to on-site engagement that I was really, really pleased with. And on one last note on this um, section is that another quantitative moment of conversion was the fact that many of the non many of the contest participants who didn't win still bought tickets to the party and came wearing their outfits or wearing their friends outfits and and really sort of turning it up a notch so we were really really pleased with that so conclusions based on this um, campaign are these. We received over uh, 60 submissions, um, over 2,500 likes, and over 350 comments. The fan favorite, which was the big fluffy white uh, feathery outfit, <laughs> um, that one got over 600 likes, which was pretty amazing. And um, during the run of this campaign, the de Young's Facebook page garnered its largest single week like increase ever. And we were really, we couldn't have been more pleased at the um, integration of meaningful engagement both online and on site. So, with that, I'm going to hand it over. Thank you. So, hi everyone again. Um, I just want to give a little bit of background on SF MoMA's, my, my role in um, SF managing SF MoMA's social media stuff. Um, I consider it a balancing act. I've really come at it from the angle of having approached the museum or come up through the museum through a number of different departments. I started as an intern in our um, interpretation department and I worked on the mobile tour and the artist videos. I did transcripts. I kind of got to know the collection really well. Um, and then I also worked in our education department working on events and um, coming in and working with families during Family Sundays for family programming. Um, and then I also worked at a desk in our education center um, doing like one-on-one -on -one visitor services. So I had kind of this broad spectrum of experience within the museum that when I came over to my to the marketing department where my position is currently located, I kind of felt like, you know, oh, and I had also never done marketing before. So I kind of felt like I was kind of pulled in from all these other realms of the museum and I wanted to put my knowledge to use to create a really balanced, interesting, dynamic social media presence. So I'm just gonna, gonna kind of run through the different um, ways that I think uh, institutions should be really balancing their social media between obviously the most um, front and foremost is social interaction. You wanna make sure that you're talking to your audience um, I keep TweetDeck on a separate monitor next to my main monitor, and I can see I'm, you know, I see in the corner of my eye when a tweet pops up, and I pretty much re, you know, move my body and then start tweeting. So if somebody tweets at SF MoMA, they can expect to get a reply within maybe 30 seconds, which is pretty cool. Oops, sorry. Um, and then also customer service. Somebody once tweeted that our Wi-Fi was down, and I was able to get somebody from our IT team up to fix it within five minutes. So that was a huge um, meaning, piece of meaningful engagement to them. Um, we also strive to provide news and information both about the museum, but also to look out into the world and say, if our followers are following us, it's not just because they specifically love SF moments, it's always because they love art and other things that relate to the museum. So 
you know, I like the example of if you have a friend on social media who's constantly posting photos of themselves, um, you're going to be really sick of their social media <laughs> after a second. So, um, but then if you have a friend who's like scouring the internet for the best of the best and is sharing that with you, you found a content source that you trust, and then you're going to have um, more appreciation for that person. Same goes with museums. And then finally, education. I like to say that art kind of sells itself as soon as you start educating people on what it's about. Um, if you can get people interested in the story for themselves, they'll go out and learn more for themselves and you know, then they'll want to come see it too. So the case study that I'm presenting today is SF MoMA's um, Submission Fridays on our Tumblr. I started our Tumblr back in, well, it was last year, so it's been up for a little more than a year. Um, because I felt kind of frustrated and limited by Facebook and Twitter. Um, Tumblr, I'm sure you've already seen a presentation where somebody was talking about the greatness of it um, already at MCN this year, but it allows you to, to kind of do what you would do with a blog, but has a social element. So you're able to pull in content and roll other people's content into your own. Um, so it's a really dynamic place to be social as an art institution. Um, so after I set up our Tumblr, there's this integrated feature on Tumblr called Submit. It's just a button that shows up in your theme. And people started using it after we set up the Tumblr without me even you know, saying anything about it. I was just getting submissions from people kind of as though they were seeing it as you know, the old school way of you would just send your slides off to a museum and their curatorial department. Who knows what they would do with them? Probably, sadly, file them away or recycle them or whatever. So, you know, in this new age, I was thinking, well, I'm getting all this stuff. What am I, I should do something with it. So I just decided one day to do an experiment and start posting it out on Fridays and call it Submission Fridays. Slapped a, slapped a hashtag on that thing <laughs> let it go. <laughs> um, and it was like an epiphany moment because I kind of followed like the sign that the audience was sending me and went with it and they were so happy. I was getting, um, immediately just huge outpouring of support for the project. People were so excited that a museum was offering a, a platform for them to publish their art where you know it's not necessarily curator vetted, um, but it's still a part of our community. So that was just a huge point of interest to a lot of people. So word spread like wildfire. Um, so yeah, basically just to run through what happened, um, since it arose organically and people just kind of fell into it, it didn't need any promotion. I basically had to do no work. <laughs> so, you know, I really liked it. Um, and then it, it's grown since it's not exhibition related. It's just museum related. We're able to, you know, never, it never has to end. It can just keep going. So after eight months, um, we've already received, I think at this point, way more than 3,400 submissions. Um, and I can't even keep up. I've only published 900 of them, which is, you know, an amazing problem to have. <laughs> when we're trying, it's like pulling teeth to try and get people to submit sometimes. We've also, even though I haven't had to do much work, the engagement we've seen on this project has been unbelievable. Um, I receive <coughs> emails and uh, fan mail through Tumblr from people whose work we uh, post, and they're just so grateful. Um, I like to call it the SF MoMA bump when we get similar to the Colbert, Colbert bump. <laughs> um, when we reblog an artist's work, they, you know, we can go in and look, and they usually get upwards of like 200 notes on that work and normally might only get three or four. So we're sort of building out this community of people who have um, submitted to us and they find their other you know, creative contributors as well. And then they end up emailing saying, thank you so much for helping me to reach a greater audience. Um, so I just also wanted to note um, some of the most popular, actually the most popular content on our Tumblr is crowdsourced which is kind of interesting. It's more popular than the actual artwork that we've posted there <laughs> from artists in our collection. This is um, on the left, you'll see a submitted Submission Friday post. Um, and on the right, you'll see <laughs> a drag queen's interpretation of a Cindy Sherman print, uh, <laughs> which was actually um, posted by SF MoMA, which I thought would be like the most viral photo that we posted ever. And it did do really well, but obviously comes nowhere near competing with the content that was just sent to us. I had to click a button to publish it, no work, and then it's just going viral by, all by itself. So another um, example of why you should trust your crowd. So takeaways from this, if your audience is sending you signals, follow them. Um, wisdom of the crowd, I guess. Use ha see how you can take what your crowd wants, flip it around and get something that you, that you need as well. Engagement, in our case. Um, 
And then, you know, form relationships with your contributors. They're going to help you out. You're going to help them out. Symbiotic relationships, that's what we're all about. Um, and then be consistent. If you can keep something going, why stop it? You know, just <coughs> let it run. All right. Thank you. Um, so before I go into my section, um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about who we are. We're kind of new kid on the block. Um, the Contemporary Jewish Museum, we've been in our current incarnation in this beautiful Daniel Liebskin building for about four years now. You know, like barely a block away from SF MoMA and San Francisco's small, so not so far from the De Young either. Um, so we're an art museum, but everything kind of has a Jewish lens on it. And what that means, we kind of redefine with every exhibition. So um, a social, to look at some of our exhibitions through a social media lens, um, here's part of a Flickr album. We have a StoryCorps story, story booth on site, collect uh, stories from anyone who wants to come in, regardless of religion, et cetera. Um, this is part of the Flickr album of that. Uh, we had an exhibition, Seeing Gertrude Stein, Five Stories, uh, one of our biggest exhibitions to date um, during the same time that SF MoMA had the Steins collect on. So this is one of our staff members just romancing Gertrude. <laughs> um, Oh, and I told everyone they could have one crazy transition in this keynote. <laughs> <laughs> so that was mine. <laughs> mine. <laughs> I know, we used that a lot. Um, and uh, right, this is a, a sleeve face uh, interpretation of uh, our exhibition, Black Sabbath, um, <laughs> which is the secret musical history of black Jewish relations. Um, right. Johnny Mathis uh, did a beautiful rendition of the Kol Nidre, if you're familiar with uh, High Holidays, so check that out. <laughs> Um, so why is this feed different from all other feeds? <laughs> a question you may recognize from the Passover table. Um, in the background, you'll see a uh, picture of challah, Jewish bread, um, and our most popular Facebook uh, image post, or one of the top ones. And I'll just share one of the comments on it, which, uh, this looks so good. I can't remember when I last lived in a town at the kosher bakery. Sigh. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I mean, the engagement on this post and comments like this just made me realize um, you know, we serve people's intellectual, aesthetic needs, but uh, with this Jewish lens, we also serve a kind of an emotional need. Um, you know, Facebook lets us communicate with people all over the world, and our highest engagement is always around Jewish holidays. Um, and it occurs, this helped, it occurred to me that uh, maybe engaging with us on Facebook is people's holiday tradition. Maybe there aren't Jews in their town, maybe this is the way they celebrate. Um, so thinking about kind of, it, it just put a, a bit of an emotional, a different kind of angle on uh, the work that I do as a Jewish museum and an art museum. Um, so I'm going to talk about something we did around the exhibition, um, or actually several years after the exhibition. Um, there's a mystery there, Sendak on Sendak. I should also say we're a non-collecting institution. We have no, ex uh, no collection whatsoever. Uh, exhibitions come and go. Um, but certainly the memory remains. And this is one of our most popular exhibitions. Um, you know, it's where the wild things are. Everybody loves it. Um, it came out in September uh, 2009, at the same time as the Spike Jones movie, which did not hurt, I'll say. <laughs> um, but then, um, oh, sorry. Uh, May 8th of this year, you may knew, know Marie Sendak passed away, um, sadly. So, um, of course, news of this hit Twitter, where people talk about such things. And one of our visitors tweeted, is anyone going to do a Marie Sendak tribute event or reading? Tagged me, tagged Miss Sarah, um, who piped in, uh, Juzim would be the best venue for this. Um, Note to self, best Twitter handle ever. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, there she is. And I thought, oh, gosh darn it, this is a really good idea. Um, so I talked to some colleagues. It's hard to make something happen really quickly in a museum. You museum professionals know. <laughs> Spontaneity is not always smiled upon. There are you know, legal issues, political issues, all this to navigate. But I talked to a few key people, and they said, OK, let's make it happen. We'll, keep, we'll just call it a story time. It's humble. It'll be fine. <laughs> um, so I did lunchtime story time, posted that out, and it kind of spread like wildfire. Um, lots and lots of retweets from institutions. Um, people, wish I was downtown, sounds nice. Even people who couldn't come were happy that it was happening. Um, we're just happy someone was doing something. So again, kind of like serving that like emotional ritual purpose, even as an arts institution. Um, yeah, and Bay Area Discovery Museum liked it so much they did an, a, uh, an event the next day. Um, so, Send X story time happened. We dug out of our, arch <laughs> the one archive we have is just like a 
prop closet, pretty much, <laughs> where we had these uh, Wild Things puppets that we brought out on the plaza, made some poor teen interns wear. <laughs> they loved it, they loved it. Um, and here's one of our, our colleagues reading the stories out in front of the museum. Um, and yeah, about 20 people showed up, some from Twitter, some were passers-by. We documented, people tweeted, they took pictures, and it kind of became this on-site digital like moment to grieve and to celebrate. So um, learnings from this. Know who on staff will be responsive to a last minute request. It's hard, I mean, if you don't know, you usually come up and you're like, hey, sorry, do you mind? I'm sure you have colleagues who do this to you, and you're like, oh God, here they come. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I mean, some people are more uh, sympathetic to kind of an internet agile kind of um, methodology. Sometimes an opportunity is just too good to pass up, and they want to serve the audience just like you do. Um, listen to good ideas that aren't your own and be prepared to act on them. I mean, like Willa said, people were telling her that they wanted to submit art and that they wanted to create a creative community around SFMOMA and their Tumblr. So if you're listening, um, sometimes you can hear such things. Um, and if the moment's there, read it, move at the point of maximum meaning. Like, it kind of had to happen to that day, on that day, because that's when people were feeling that. Um, so yeah, despite the rush, it's worth it and a totally new way of us engaging with our audience. So, actually, I'm going to continue. Um, so our next section, Museum to Museum. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little story about a group called the Super Friends, <laughs> which is a ridiculous name for what is actually a really kind of neat thing, which I'll relay to you right now. So <laughs> um, I started uh, at the Contemporary Jewish Museum about three and a half years ago, so shortly after it opened. Um, in the marketing department and maybe like many of that era founded our accounts just said like hey marketing director is it cool if I do this okay great I'm gonna do it and um, then realized kind of I'm the public voice of the museum that's kind of a big deal let me see if anyone else is kind of grappling with some of the same things I am so I went across the street talked to SF MoMA um, Willa wasn't there yet but uh, Ian Padgham was um, and we talked and it just became clear Everyone was kind of grappling with the same things. There were different degrees. We used to talk about the sphere of ignorance, like, which pretty much meant like how high up in the institution were people aware of what you do, like as regards social media. Uh, <laughs> I mean, a few years ago, you know, it's it's changing certainly. Um, so we realized there's a lot to talk about, a lot of mistakes. We hoped only one of us would have to make. Um, so after that, we decided to chat with you know, see if we could reach out to other museums. San Francisco is seven miles by seven miles, it's not that big, although there is a lot of rich art culture, so sure enough, people were very open to meeting with us, and thus the super friends were born. Um, Asian Art Museum, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, um, Cartoon Art Museum for period, Walt Disney Family Museum, um, Exploratorium, California Academy of Sciences, I'm sure I'm forgetting something that I'll feel terrible about, but, um, <laughs> and beyond, Oakland Museum. It kind of spread beyond the Bay. Everyone had conversation, or, you know, wanted to have conversations about this sort of thing. And, um, yeah, it was, it just, uh, it was a really fertile topic, and everyone was very willing to talk. And here are some of the real super friends, and we meet every month, and I want to emphasize it's, like, I don't, I, it's not a networking group. I can't call it, maybe I do to like, if I need to justify like leaving early or something, but to call it a networking group isn't exactly accurate. Um, More of a support group. Yeah, I would say it's a support group plus. So it started out just being like, no one understands. Um, that's not really the case anymore, you know, fast forward a few years, but sometimes it still is. Um, so what I learned kind of from helping to grow this in-person um, this in-person group, uh, museum to museum, is that, uh, which I'll, I'll go back and say like, yeah, we, it started out completely non-competitively and even four years later, there's still very much that vibe. So um, I learned digital communication benefits greatly from in-person communication. So I say things on Twitter to my colleagues, like if I didn't know them, I just couldn't say. And it makes for much more interesting conversations. I mean, two marketers talking, you can tell, right? You can kind of feel that. Um, and you know, our audience feels that, they're very savvy. And if our conversation seems authentic, that's because it is. It's because we know each other, we can give each other crap, gently, gently, but um, <laughs> you know, it's because it's real. 
Um, also, it allows you to have multiple channels to discuss incidents, internal or external. So, you know, anything from something you're dealing with politically to, like we had this huge PR crisis around the Stein exhibition, which will be a whole other talk that I'll give when I've recovered emotionally. <laughs> um, but I was able to kind of have some of my colleagues monitoring channels, reading that Gawker article that came out, and letting me know, <laughs> you know, are you managing this well? Um, you know, what the external perspective is, but they did so kind of with sympathy and with an awareness of what I was going through. Um, and to continue with the, uh, psychoanalytic vibe of this section of uh, vulnerability makes healthy relationships possible. Take that for your personal life as well, but um, it's, right, it's not a networking group. I'm not, if I was worried about impressing them too much, it wouldn't work. Like, we are very open about the challenges we face. We're very open about, um, you know, about the difficulties and uh, very, very supportive because we know that <laughs> in this particular industry, and it is quite a blessing that we do better together, so. Oh, I'll just take that. Um, so as Kathy mentioned, um, one of the wonderful things about getting all of us super friends in a room together is that we really just broke down any preconceptions of competition existing between our institutions. And now, rather than um, working within that framework, we actually seek out and cultivate opportunities for collaboration. Um, and one such collaboration has taken its form in live tweeting each other's press previews, which is has been really, really wonderful. And um, so each, each of us obviously runs our institution's um, Twitter handles, but we also have our own Twitter handles, which are, for better or worse, very closely associated with our museums. Um, so in that sense, you get you know two for the price of one when you invite one of these lovely ladies to your press preview, which is great uh, just for outreach um, in numbers, that sort of thing. Um, well, it doesn't always make sense for every exhibition, obviously, to bring in outside museum tweeters. There have been a few uh, meaningful instances as of late that uh, I was luck lucky enough to invite these ladies in and wherein the exhibition's really closely aligned with um, messaging and content uh, for SF MoMA and the Contemporary Jewish Museum. And the first of these was last summer's exhibition at the Legion of Honor, Man Ray Lee Miller, Partners in Surrealism. Um, five years ago, about um, SF MoMA hosted an exhibition on the photography of Lee Miller. So that was obviously a match subject-wise. And wait for it, Man Ray, important surrealist artist, was a Jew. So I was like, I'm calling Kathy. And uh, moreover, and more substantively, the exhibition also covered um, the World War II era and Lee Miller's really meaningful uh, photography from that period. So um, by coalescing the institutional scope uh, and following of these two important um, San Francisco mu museums with the Legion of Honors exhibition and following, we're really able to present our exhibition within a cultural uh, landscape um, based in our city. Um, and also, at the same time, like tripling our, our Twitter outreach by just bringing in these, these two people. Um, but harnessing the massive Twitter following of SF MoMA, say, doesn't come without risk. So as many of you know, photography is generally prohibited in special exhibition galleries, but for press previews, we, we uh, drop down those restrictions and let press uh, take pictures of the exhibition in, or, in order to get the word out. But this may come as a surprise, museums are not press. And so um, Willa in- Or are they? <laughs> yes, right, or are they? This is maybe another topic of uh, discussion, but. So Willa, you know, acting as any press outlet would, was taking pictures of the exhibition um, and then tweeting them out via her own handle as well as SF MoMA's handle. And the Lee Miller archives got wind of these images, which of course were received very favorably by SF MoMA's extensive audience. They were favorited and they were retweeted out the wazoo. And so Lee Miller contacted SF, or the Lee Miller archives, not Lee Miller herself. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> that would have been really, really dramatic. But <laughs> so uh, the Lee Miller Archives contacted SF MoMA's copyright office, and then of course Willa emailed me and was like, um, "What's going on?" And so after you know a few slightly stressful emails going back and forth between our three institutions, we were able able to smooth it over and work it out and communicate to the Lee Miller Archives that we had expressly invited SF MoMA to our museum to help get the word out about this exhibition and that it was in greater service of the exhibition and the Lee Miller legacy as a whole. Um, but, you know, since this incident, obviously we have re-examined our live tweeting guides and it's, again, a moving target. Um, but it's a really great example of how unusual this kind of museum-to-museum -museum collaboration is and how it can result in some unintended challenges and complications. Um, the second exhibition that warrants discussion is our current exhibition going on right now at the de Young Museum. If you're in San Francisco, go check it out, about um, this fellow William S. Paley. So the William S. Paley collection, A Taste for Modernism, as the title implies, was another good fit for to bring SF MoMA in. Um, and one of the key, marquee paintings that's in the show is Picasso's Boy Leading a Horse, which actually was featured in the Steins Collect at SF MoMA the previous summer. Um, and, wait for it, yet again, William S. Paley was a Jew, too, so. <laughs> um, but again, it's a, it's a totally different perspective in this case because he was actually the CBS um, co-founder and chairman, a hugely powerful media mogul, but as a Jew, he was still, uh, many social doors were closed to him, and so interestingly enough, he used his art collecting practices and art collection as a way to sort of ameliorate his standing in those uh, upper echelons of society and, and better his place. So. Um, so I, I brought these, brought Willa and Kathy in again, and we had a really great time. And a, a particularly elegant example, I think, of this um, coalescing of our of our three institutional messages can be seen in uh, this series of pictures that we all took virtually simultaneously, probably standing right next to each other, I don't remember exactly, of uh, Picasso's The Architect's Table. And I just love how we all sort of come at it from a different perspective. We all call out a different aspect of it. And it really starts to show you how we are all in this together. All of our museums are working to better all of our understanding of art. And you know, it really sort of brings to bear the cultural landscape within which we all live and work. So I will now hand it over to Willa. Willa. Olivia, I don't know where that Olivia. came from. <laughs> Making stuff up. Um, thanks, Sarah. That's. I just want to emphasize what you just said about um, we're all in this together, marketing the arts or educating about the arts. We have one common goal of getting people to love the arts as much as we do, so <laughs> collaborate. Um, it's our burden and our gift. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So hashtags. Um, we've all tried to launch a hashtag and we've all seen, you know, successful hashtags and weird hashtags, but I want to talk about the Museum Olympics hashtag, which um, uh, hopefully some of you saw it. it was running throughout the run of the real Olympics. Um, you may remember the Olympics, you probably forgot though because you were so interested in the Museum <laughs> Olympics. Um, but so I just wanted to, we just want to talk about how um, we actually came up with the Museum Olympics and why it was successful. So we were at a meeting of super friends um, at a bar and we were trying to figure out how could we leverage the buzz that would be surrounding the regular Olympics to talk about art because you know when everyone's talking about one thing and you're talking about some random you know exhibition, nobody's going to listen to you or you just seem irrelevant. Um, so we wanted to treat it topically and try and weasel our way into a great, interesting, meaningful form of interaction that we could all participate in. So. We came away from that a little bit. You know, we had probably had one too many drinks and didn't come out with a clear plan. <laughs> so, you know, in order to launch a hashtag, you really need to sit down and iron out the logistics. You can't just tweet something out and expect it to snowball and grow on its own. It takes work. So, I basically sat down and figured out, you know, how can this work? What's the um, system going to be? 
Um, we need to have people scheduled to tweet at different times. We need to know, hopefully, what the tweets, or at least some of the tweets will be in advance so that we can start working on our responses. I know a lot of people are so busy, especially if, you're, if you wear many hats at your museum, you'll be away from your desk for three hours. You're not gonna be able to respond in an interesting way to somebody's tweet if it goes out and then you're gone. So we were, we were really orchestrating how this would unfurl. Um, so we were able to put together a content plan and share it throughout our email chains between all the super friends so that we you know, had the foresight in our mind of what, when we'd be engaging and what would, we would be talking about. So that was just a way to heighten the meaning and interestingness of the campaign. Um, and so this rolled out, I think it kicked off the night before, or the Monday, or sorry, the Friday before the Olympics launched, and then on Monday when we were all back in the office, we just went for it. And people loved it. They thought it was so cool that all of us were working on this one, ha working under this one hashtag and sharing really interesting works from our collection that related in kind of tangential but interesting ways to the Olympics. I think we talked about like the nude as it relates to the Olympics and you know, in Grecian times versus how now everyone wears clothes, it's weird. Same thing with art, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, it caught on fire. Maybe it was because of that. <laughs> um, by the end, it sort of just kept picking up, um, picking up new people. We had 300 people and institutions participating and over 900 artworks shared, which probably would never have been shared had we not started this hashtag. Um, and so another interesting thing with topical hashtags is that you know, the art press is always sort of looking for the strange, interesting thing that they can write about. And, you know, they're not, they don't have an easy way in to catch on with the buzz of the Olympics either. So this was sort of a natural way, thing for them to write about. And we ended up getting um, pretty interesting articles written by, I think, Wall Street Journal, artinfo.com, um, a few other ones that, you know, allowed us to feel like we had actually accomplished something. And then, of course, that contributed to even more people joining the tag. And Museum Olympics was trending for almost the whole week on Twitter. So basically we feel, we feel that this was successful because we made art relevant at a time when it wouldn't have been relevant, which is always what we collaborate to do. Um, so one, one thing just to note is that if you're gonna do something like this that you think could have a really far reach, you should coordinate with your PR department. Um, we found that the stories, while they were great, they were getting the story completely wrong and it was a little frustrating since we put so much work into it. Um, we kind of wanted to feel like we could tell our story, which is a cool story about our collaboration. And of course, the press just assumed it was like some random thing that happened. <laughs> but we know. So anyway, that's just a side note. Um, but anyway, to sum up, um, hashtags don't write themselves. You know, you really need to think of it as something that's catchy and sticky and that you could see lots of different angles from which to approach it so that you can heighten the amount of people who could identify and participate. And then collaborate with social media influencers. If you just start a hashtag by yourself, it won't go anywhere. You really need to leverage the relationships you have with other influencers. For us, you know, we pack a punch when all the super friends are tweeting together. We can pretty much guarantee something to be successful. But if you're working within your institution, one thing that I've found success with is inviting, I keep a spreadsheet of social media influencers in the area in San Francisco who, um, are interested in arts and culture, and I know that they like SFMOMA, so I can invite them to previews and give them uh, special access to exhibitions, and in return, I don't even have to ask them, they just do it, they tweet pictures and say how much they had fun, and then you know their 200,000 followers or whatever are seeing that. And then finally, be topical, but don't sacrifice your quality. If you're jumping onto an interesting hashtag, you still have to make something interesting happen in your own tweet. Um, you, it's just not gonna automatically be interesting. Um, and then don't forget to invite your followers to engage. I think we run the risk of getting really um, trapped in our own like awesome. dialogues no. between <laughs> each other's museums and it can kind of feel like a circle jerk <laughs> <laughs> or an echo chamber. But, um, <laughs> but it doesn't have to be that way. You just have to remember that um, your followers are out there and they're just kind of waiting to be invited or to figure out how you want them to participate. They want to know what you want from them. They're not just going to assume. So, yes. Oh, and then finally, one last thing. Um, this is just driving home that point of no more competition, only collaboration. Um, this blog post on the right is actually something I, I wrote, and it, the content didn't really fit, fit with what we normally publish on SF MoMA's blog, so, um, but Sarah was like, hey, why don't we publish it on the de Young's blog? And 
you know, thought about that and thought, why not? So we did that. Um, and then the leaderboard on the left was um, James of the YBCA's way of kind of, we wanted to have some kind of closing ceremonies for the Museum Olympics so that it wouldn't just drizzle off and end and everyone would forget about it. So we, he created this very satisfying way of making it seem like the museums were actually getting gold medals or actually, and a lot of the medalists were people, not museums, participants. So mix up, yeah, and then we all collaborate on that. He put it together and then we of course had to have our long ridiculous email chain where we all weighed in on what we thought and so in the end we felt like we all really owned it. So mm -hmm. that was successful. Okay, That's you, so. no, sorry. okay. transition. <laughs> so now the museum and again, uh, or, and how it communicates with itself and with its staff. And of course, there are threads throughout the other presentations on this. But um, So I'm going to look at a case study on a project we're doing called SF Photo Hunt. It's currently happening with this exhibition that's currently on view, The Radical Camera, New York's Photo League, 1936 to 1951, um, originated by the Jewish Museum New York. Um, so this is about a kind of the Photo League was a group of kind of socially conscious, um, kind of photographers who captured their city in a way that was very personal, and uh, their cameras always went with them everywhere. The 35 millimeter was now widely um, accessible, um, so it was very much about capturing their New York and the New York that they saw. So this reminded me of <laughs> mobile photography and kind of the crazy uh, developments that have happened with the iPhone, um, and just how people express themselves through photography now, especially in digital social spaces. Um, so as an exemplar of this, um, on the right is a picture from the exhibition, um, Brooklyn Bridge by Alexander Aland, and on the left is a photograph of the Golden Gate Bridge by my colleague uh, Christine Hopkins. So, um, you know, then and now, Instagram versus kind of like um, old-timey photography, <laughs> traditional development methods. Um, so with this image, I was able to kind of sell the board and um, and my staff members on the fact that there's something really uh, contemporarily resonant about this. So we, we launched SF Photo Hunt, um, Instagram contest, but also accepted submissions through email and Twitter and um, just for accessibility reasons. And you put a hashtag out there, you're gonna get it from anywhere a hashtag's accessible. So, um, and basically we came up with a series of different challenges inspired by the exhibition. Um, and I'll share a few of those with you. Um, oh, and then the other thing, through a uh, collaboration with Curatorial, um, we were able to uh, create an installation actually um, on the way into the gallery space. So before people see the New York of the 30s through 50s, they see the San Francisco of 2012. Um, so that was pretty, that was really exciting, kind of helped to bring some contemporary context um, to, yeah, to the exhibition. Um, this is an example of one of the challenges we launched uh, with this Walter Rosenblum uh, photograph. Uh, that was, we always use a photograph from the exhibition to prompt people. So this is the Secret Spaces Challenge. And this is the Secret Spaces winner at Senorita on Instagram. Um, this is the City Ritual Challenge, Aaron Siskind image of the wishing tree in Harlem. Um, it was kind of a ritual to touch this tree before performing at one of the venues. And here's some boys around it. And then this is the City Ritual winner by Kay Tuchinskaya, at Kay Tuchinskaya on Instagram. Um, just people lined up in the morning um, on their digital devices as a kind of contemporary ritual. Um, so, and some of them like reflected the formal qualities of the Photo League uh, works and some of them didn't. Uh, we kept it really open. Um, so, to start this off, right, to throw a party and no one comes is the worst thing in the world. It's great to start with staff. Um, a lot of our staff were on Instagram, so I kind of, you know, I, I was trying to figure it out and I put out a call to some folks and I got uh, a lot of amazing images. All these images you see here are entirely done by staff. Um, and that became our campaign. All s staff images comprise the entirety of our photo hunt campaign, which was both digital and actually in part a, uh, a traditional print campaign. So, um, working with staff in this way, both to collaborate on the on-site installation and in the promotion and in kind of like helping this to catch fire, which it has. We have about uh, 2,500 submissions to date on the SF Photo Hunt hashtag and each uh, challenge gets an average of uh, about 300 submissions. Um, 
gave me a couple of hard lessons. I mean, a project like this, we want people to learn, we want people to create, we want uh, people to see themselves in the picture, and everyone has a stake in that in the museum. Development wanted a, uh, you know, a slideshow at the opening of member images, so we made a member hashtag. Um, Curatorial had very specific vision of how it should be presented, um, or, you know, moderation is always the like bear of uh, user-generated content stuff in the museum. So we had to work with uh, curatorial to make sure that the moderation was up to their standards. And education, I mean making and seeing yourself in the picture and creating meaning around uh, exhibitions, that's their game. So we worked with everyone and, you know, politically it gets very challenging. So I learned it belongs to all of us, you know, no matter, but leading isn't stealing. So being the one kind of in charge of the digital communities, I, I did feel like I was in a good position to kind of lead this in initiative in a way that would ensure success, but I really had to check in with absolutely every department um, and to make sure everyone was satisfied. Um, a, m a more surprising thing was that uh, you really want to provide the same creative opportunities to your colleagues that you do to your audience, and you don't always know who the artists are in your office. I was shocked by the quality, like the beauty and the like insightfulness of the images that were submitted that were just an email away from my colleagues and ended up be becoming our print campaign. Um, so <laughs> I learned, you ask everyone because you never know. Maybe you have the person you go to because you're comfortable, because it's easy, because they're more responsive, but you really want to ask everyone and leverage the richness that you have on site. All right, so. Um, let's segue now into the more little bit trickier of a con uh, conversation, which is how do you develop an institutional social media policy? Um, this was a question that was brought up. We, ha we held a Muse Social chat last Friday, and I think I asked the question, well, I know I asked the question <laughs> uh, for museum staffers, have you been asked uh, to tweet about your job in the museum, and how did that go down? Um, and then, as you can see, if you can read that, um, the responses were weird. Um, <laughs> it seemed like a kind of a strange, like everybody had approached it from a different angle and um, it didn't seem like anyone had found the perfect solution. So I um, thought I'd think more about that. Um, so we had a new MNC director at SFMOMA start a few months back and uh, one of the first initiatives that she and I were planning to work on was to uh, tackle the social media policy and hope to get more staff to elevate more staff's voices through social media. So I started um, research and found a bunch of social media policies online from I think like Target and terrible corporations who didn't have anything to do with museums. That was my first mistake. Um, and I drafted this policy that was three pages or so long and it sounded like a, a lawyer had written it. Um, and it was very intimidating. So I circulated it out to a few people to, to get their thoughts um, and everyone hated it. So <laughs> they were, the, the guidelines were seen as really intimidating and a turnoff. Um, and at SFMOMA, I realized that we didn't really have the problem of like too many staff tweeting all the time. That was actually a problem that we wished we had, in which case we would have had use for these guidelines. Um, but I realized I could fit pretty much everyone who tweeted at work from SFMOMA into one Follow Friday tweet, <laughs> which is only 140 characters, so not that many. Um, so. Basically, the guidelines didn't seem to be the right solution. And also another thing was that I didn't really feel comfortable being the one policing that sort of activity. It felt really weird for me to um, you know, tell people what they could and couldn't do on their personal social media accounts from work. It seemed sort of like they should be able to figure that out for themselves. So moving forward, I would be lying if, I'd, if I said we sorted this out at all yet at SFMOMA. I think I agreed to speak on this three months ago, and you're like, yeah, I can totally finish that in three months. But um, we're going through a, a, re, or a brand reimagining right now. So our plan is to use our um, brand once we've ironed it out as a way to kind of pin down the voice of the institution and use that as a way to kind of inform our policy. Or I don't think it'll be a policy. I think it'll. I'm hoping it'll be something more simplified. Um, I'm gunning for our whole policy just to be use common sense. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that'll work out. But, um, and then this last carrots, not sticks. I thought this was a really, int I got it, uh, this came as a um, Muse social response. It took me a minute to figure it out. But what I realized was 
this metaphor is about a horse who could either be led forward to a better future by a carrot dangling in front of them, or you could whack them from behind with a stick. And one solution is clearly better. So you want to reward um, your staff members for their participation. Um, this goes, you know, you can do this in many ways. Um, but first, you have to get them to feel like they have a place to participate. Um, so I'm still working on this myself, but a goal for me is to work with more staff throughout the museum and kind of get out of my silo and get out of my comfort zone. I'm in marketing, um, but I really always feel like the work is not good unless I'm working with somebody you know, in a different department. So, and then inventing opportunities. It can be really easy to just kind of you know, forget to do stuff or just not have time, but as long as you're inventing opportunities and setting deadlines to achieve them with other people for their participation, you'll gu guarantee yourself that you'll move forward. And then lastly, it's really important to showcase successes. Um, the model of the guidelines seem to not want to showcase success, but rather just showcase um, like violations. But um, if you're proactively taking content that staff creates um, and showing it to showing it off and congratulating them or whatever you want to call it, um, that's a really great way to get more people interested. And this, these screenshots are, I find this to be really inspiring. Used by SF MoMA, we we were able to take content from um, social media and feature it on SF MoMA's website in this kind of dynamic setting where it was put alongside content created by our curators, essays by our curators, um, videos from artists and other types of you know, content that's museum quality produced. So we're kind of just validating that this content is worthwhile and it's, you know, staff should uh, prioritize it accordingly. And eventually you'll get your staff excited enough that they'll wanna come out on 11, 11, 11 at 11, 11, 11 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> take a picture with you. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I can do this. I just need the remote. Oh, sorry. Um, so I'm going to pick up on this thread of museums engaging within and of themselves now and sort of talk about where I live, which is not where you think I may live. Um, I am one of these things is not like the others. That's me. So I'm an outlier in the digital media world because I live in curatorial. Um, when I, ooh. So when I first came onto this, into this role, my mandate was primarily to act as a liaison between the curatorial department and the marketing department. Um, and that really took its form in populating the blog with curatorial content and um, implementing visual representation on our collections pages. But um, as my role developed and it became increasingly clear that my uh, particular skill set was better allocated to social media um, efforts, a power struggle of sorts began wherein uh, my marketing counterpart and I had difficulty communicating with each other about when and how and what we were going to post on social media. Um, as the incumbent, my counterpart requested that I inform him of every post that I was going to make or think of making, um, which initially I complied with because I think it's a good idea to have a record and some sort of public forum for in, uh, where this information can be shared. So I created a public calendar, which he never looked at. and. Um, but so, the, and then the more frustrating thing was that um, on the flip side, he would never talk to me about what he was posting, when or where, or what the content was. So this is an example here of a major communication breakdown where I had posted a scheduled, it was on the calendar and everything, um, post about a major user-generated content engagement campaign that I was initiating, um, soliciting uh, users' images of the Golden Gate Bridge in celebration of its 75th uh, anniversary, which was in May. Um, and, you know, about five minutes later, he posted a, uh, this artist birthday post, which I love artist birthdays. Everybody loves artist birthdays. But if you're trying to get people to really start thinking about, oh, well, what image am I going to submit for this Golden Gate Bridge? Oh, wait, what? Who's George Innes? Okay. You know, I mean, the users, they, you need to give time, you need to give posts time to percolate and you need to give them um, priority on the feed and that whole sort of thing. So th this was a real struggle. Um, and last year at Museums in the Web, one of, or this year in April, actually, um, one of the really sort of salient nuggets that I came away with was that social media is not a tech job, it's a people job. And um, so as my role 
as the as my role began to really sort of blur the lines between curatorial and marketing, this axiom uh, really rang truer than ever. Um, and so, you know, as much as I may have been frustrated or angry or shut out, I just kept barreling forward and keeping the lines of communication open. Um, and that proved really the best and only way to move forward or at least approximate a, f a sense of forward motion. Um, if you think about what a curator does, it's to research a topic to its greatest depth and come up with an interesting thesis about that topic and share it with the public, whether it's in an exhibition or an essay or a catalog. And um, the way I see it, the whole museum is my topic. And I'm constantly striving to come up with interesting stories to, to highlight or interesting and alternative voices from within the museum uh, to feature. And herein lies a little bit of the rub with marketing, um, whose strategic pr priorities are necessarily de designed around the promotion of special exhibitions um, and other revenue or attendance generating ventures. Um, and I completely appreciate that these are high priority items, but they don't represent the entire story of the museums on any given day. Um, so what I try to do in my role is really fill in these gaps and focus in on some of the smaller projects, the lower profile projects that don't necessarily generate content but are highly interesting and oftentimes making major contributions to the field. Um, and I've recently come up against some, uh, or come up with, I, I've, I've been facing a, um, a desire from the marketing department to streamline all of our social media posting to coincide with the marketing strategic priorities, um, which would pretty much take away this this focus that I've really been trying to highlight these alternative voices. So. Um, we have the Fine Arts of Museums of San Francisco. We are two museums. We are the De Young and the Legion of Honor. There is like 50 things going on at any given day. There are incredible stories there that are coming out of both of those institutions on any given day. Half of them have nothing to do with special exhibitions. So by not telling that story and by not putting those voices out there, we're not telling the whole story about who we are as, as, a fine arts, as the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Um, conversely, curators generally have little to no use for social media either. <laughs> so um, either they don't understand it or they actively fight against it. And so one of the ways that I have tried to mitigate this um, mentality is to set up uh, digital media planning sessions, whether in the early stages of an exhibition planning or more often running up to its opening. And these really allow for the curators to contribute their content and their expertise and their ideas to the conversation, and also to see how that, that information will be integrated into a wider strategic social media um, campaign. And uh, so basically, these meetings generally include myself, the curators, and or their curatorial assistants, perhaps a, a marketing and communications representative, um, and uh, members of the public programs team. And this way, we all get together. We bring all the stakeholders to the table. We duke it out, hash it out, get all the ideas on the table. And this way, no one is, is surprised, or at least not negatively so. So as we wind down and sort of think about how can we do this job without giving ourselves all heart attacks, these are some of the mantras that I live by. You know always focus on cultivating and sharing the diverse and multiple voices in your museum. I mean, those that's where the really interesting content lies. And and blast it out through your channels. You know, you, you have an institutional channel, so use it to share with the world these really interesting, quirky voices that exist within the museums. No matter how frustrated you get, or how at your wit's end, or tired, or pissed off you are, never, ever close the door of communication. You always just have to keep going back, and you have to keep your ears, and your heart, and your mind open. Um, be a good listener. Be democratic. Know that there are all of these stories, and they are all interesting, and try to, to forefront as many as you can. And when it comes to the end of the day, you just can't please everyone all the time. And that's OK. So with that, I think we uh, 
are ready to, do we have one more here? Oh yeah, now we wanna hear what you guys think because just like uh, you know, our Super Friends group provides unending support to us, we know that you all have lots of ideas and stories and questions. I already see one coming up, so please just let her rip. Yeah, and we're gonna, um, we are going to pull up the um, Twitter, feed. Twitter feed for the Muse social tag. So if you have questions, you can either um, stand up and ask them here, or you can tweet and we'll hope that we see it. Not, this is another experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what's gonna happen? Um, we also have Museum Nerd fielding us um, responses and chat around happening on the Muse social tag. So if anyone even is following, looks like everyone's staring at their phones, which is great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you're noticing anything interesting cropping up and you want to surface it to the live audience, um, just let us know and we'll pass the baton. Yeah. Should we get this going around for sure. everybody? So. I just have a functional question um, for, I guess, you at the De Young and SF MoMA who've done these kinds of um, user-generated content submissions where there's awards, or um, how do you, obviously with the, with the um, Gautier, he, <laughs> that's amazing to have a judge right. that's <laughs> that we close lucky. to the source of it, um, but at what point for other generated, um, user generated submissions, how do you, you know, either define, decide the winners or decide who you're going to post on the submission Fridays? Um, I think you said you had 900 submission, yeah, but over 23 have yeah. been. That's actually a really great question because um, I decide kind of randomly. Um, I think that this would represent. Can I? Oh, we need the mic back. Okay. Why don't we just have, I don't think the, well, do the questions, we we'll can just, just repeat, yeah, the, we'll questions. Just repeat Sorry. the questions. So um, that's a great question because repeat. I think that this, he was on mic already, yeah, so it's fine. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so I basically decide myself <laughs> for Submission Fridays, just it's a workflow thing. Obviously it would be great if I could get somebody more knowledgeable, um, like curatorial, but at the same time, this content is specific to social media and I think that is where in the, would lie the rub. Um, so if we were saying these are actually endorsed um, by curatorial or something, that I think is where we would, it would get sticky, but because it's social media and we're keeping it separate, we're allowed to be kind of, um, I don't know, what's the word? We can just kind of move forward and make our own choices. Um, Obviously, we kept a clause that was like, we will publish as many as we can, and we're not saying specifically whether we're publishing based on merit or, you know, we're not saying how we're judging them. Um, we're not really trying to judge them. We're basically just trying to post as many as we can from as many different people as long as they're high quality. So I know you're going to now ask, well, what does high quality mean? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you can kind of tell when something looks interesting enough to go on your feed. Yeah, and I mean, I would again sort of reiterate that the ideal is not to have a reward, you know? Um, so I've had some, the that Golden Gate Bridge contest, people were just like, we love the Golden Gate Bridge, we're gonna post our pictures, blah, blah, blah. And so I didn't, you know, I didn't announce this at the beginning of it, but we did get tons and tons and tons of submissions and it was wonderful. And so I was like, hey, we're having a celebration of the, um, of the bridge's birthday during our Friday nights. Why don't we put up a screen and, and have these running in a digital slideshow? So that's an added incentive of like, oh, here you have a digital exhibition of your work. You get to be in the museum and, it, you know. Um, and then, again, I, for some I have judged myself, but, or I've asked a curator to look at things. Um, Curators tend to slow things down a great deal, or they just aren't interested and, and they don't, it doesn't really resonate with them. I mean, I did, with one curator, I asked her to help me judge an, uh, a competition, and she was like, oh, I just trust you, go ahead, do it. And I'm like, all right, I'll do it, you know? And so, you, it depends on the contest, and it depends on the content, and the reward, I guess. <laughs> and I'll just add for SF Photo Hunt, um, so I end up, right, it's very much about I guess my taste and preference and what I know of the show, but I'll pick about um, 50 and then I'll send it out in a private Flickr album to a cross-departmental consortium, so curators, educators, even our teen interns um, who have expressed an interest in participating, and then um, they vote, rank it one to five, and I have like a whole yeah. algorithm <laughs> that where I'll, um, and that's how we pick the winner. And uh, 
we're, I don't like contests myself, so I've had to like really, <laughs> like I'm just not motivated by them. I'm motivated more by creative prompts, but I thought for the, in this instance, we were giving Lamography cameras, like 35 millimeter old school to all of the winners. And then um, we'll have like Elytra cameras, the big um, final thing. So it's just a way of, I don't know, I felt like celebrating the phot photography community. So I'll take that. Um, I'm seeing an interesting question from the Oakland Museum. Um, how do you work out the timing for post tweets on a daily basis? This is another kind of technical question, but I think it comes back to the idea of being social. Um, I've gotten pressure before from varying people in my museum to pre-schedule a lot of things out and plan really far in advance for what we're going to do. Like, what's the campaign going to be for this thing happening three months from now? And that has always felt very inorganic and frustrating to me when it's sort of like planning a conversation you're going to have at a dinner party three months from now where you're not even sure who's going to be there. <laughs> it's just like, blah. So I think for me anyway, the way that I plan out social media activity is obviously based on um, exhibitions and the kind of traditional stuff we have to do to promote the museum and the exhibitions. But then the main thing that I think is really important is to leave time for the social interactions to happen and plan the time into your day Planning the time into your day is akin to planning them out. So if you plan time, you know they'll happen. So just, you know, as you're moving forward and posting the things you have to keep putting out there, just don't forget to have the things that are being topical and brought up integrated and um, prioritized. In the room. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, first of all, for a great presentation. Um, I'm curious if any of you have a social media strategy or goals in place for what you want to achieve with your interactions in social media with your audiences, because we always keep going back to that, is what are we really trying to achieve with this? Are we just trying to talk to more people? Are we trying to get them into the museum? So I was just wondering if you have any formal strategy in place. Um, I'm going to repeat the question, which was just, do we have a sort of overarching social media strategy in place? our goals? <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer to can I sum that up in the last few minutes of our Q&A, no. It's, it was, I worked on creating a strategy document at the beginning of this year and it was 100 pages long. Um, I had to edit it down and now it's at 20 pages. Um, it involved pulling in research from different platforms, you know, demographics, who's where, what are we going to put where based on who they are. Um, it's really complicated, but it kind of, for me anyways, uh, ended up being super akin to what I talked about at the beginning, which was having a well-balanced um, strategy where you're doing a lot of things well. So um, I can give you a card and talk to you more about how we formed our strategy. I think there's a lot of ways you could go about it. Obviously, you know, you can't just have one or two main goals. You're going to have to be pretty broad, but then come out with your actionables as well. So it is a long process, though, but happy to forward around some more stuff on that. Yeah, I have a 20-page document as well, but <laughs> it's really hard to keep it in mind. So I have two post-its on my desk. <laughs> One is, why should, I, why should someone be interested in someone else's culture? Our audience is like 50% Jewish, 50% non-Jewish, so I always try to keep that in mind. And then the other one is, uh, stay close to the art. So um, just if I don't know what to post, and there's not a Jewish holiday, which is already like, should we be posting about that in general? But um, I go back to the exhibitions. Um, so 20 pages down to two post-its, it's all, that's my method so far. Well, and I'll just say, I mean, I've only been in this role actually for um, doing social media for about a year, so I'm really sort of trying to learn all our channels still before coming up with a strategy, but I, I have one in my heart. <laughs> I have an intuitive strategy, but yeah, we haven't, we haven't really hammered that out as of yet at our institution. Yeah. When you guys are choosing uh, a sort of coalition of colleagues to give you personal are you choosing them based on their sort of personality and existing social media presence, or are you choosing them based on their, their role in the museum? And like, who would you pick and why? Because I think that our museum is trying to do that, and our social media coordinator is like, well, do we need someone from the library and someone from this, or do we just need the people we know have like social media savvy kind of you know, points of view. Right. Um, this is, yeah, it's a, like a growing pain. 
Um, sure. Um, she's wondering how, like, in choosing a colleague group or a, a collaboration group, like, how do you how do you choose? Is it based on position? Is it based on like interest and kind of tech savviness? Because that's becoming increasing, like, across departments and museums. Um, and the answer, right, it started just with people whose job descriptions seemed to resemble our own, or who owned the Twitter feed. Like, we wanted to talk on Twitter, so who owned the Twitter feed? Um, but yeah, definitely. As it's growing, it's kind of expanding now. There are managers, there are coordinators, there's marketing, there's curatorial. Um, it's expanding, and it's important to keep a small group. Uh, so uh, I don't know. So there's that uh, experience of trust, but it's also important to be welcoming and like fully collaborative. So we're kind of in an in-between moment. <laughs> and I would add to that, um, there's always going to be natural contributors, like people that just seem like they would be good. And those are just great choices because, you know, it's like banging a square peg into a round hole or as the saying goes, you know, if your curator is 70 and has never used Twitter, not a good choice. Um, <laughs> Probably, <laughs> Probably not a good choice. <laughs> That's true. You never know. But um, just in terms of your workload, like if you can identify people who are already interested, seem interested in contributing or who have, who are working every day with content that seems like really suitable to social media, maybe your archivist is coming across amazing photos every day. Um, you just have to encourage them and come up with a plan of how they're going to take what they see every day, fit it into your institutional voice or, you know, what are we going to do with it and then present it and then set deadlines like I mentioned. The other thing too is, I mean, and I don't know if this is exactly addressing your question, but keeping those lines of communication open can be really beneficial. Um, I have people who in my in my organization who are really tapped into the internet or Twitter or social media or whatever and they may not necessarily want to post out from the institutional channels but they'll either post something awesome and then I'll steal it with their permission and um, with their blessing or they'll send me an email and say hey did you see this it's really great or this thing is happening maybe would this be a good blog post is this something that would be interesting to the audience so just letting people know that you are open to their suggestions, step one. You know, I think a lot of times people think that you're just work, I mean, I get this all the time. People think I'm just working in a vacuum and that I'm just going it solo and I have this whole like directive and half the time I'm like, what am I gonna post today, you know? And so when people come up to me and or send me notes or whatever, I'm like, oh, thank goodness. Okay, here's something I can do. This is gonna be really cool. This is gonna be really great. And then you also, in that same vein, you really, you continue with the mission to um, highlight these alternative voices that exist within your museum, so. I would also add that if you're not, if you're in the audience or watching online and you're not um, a social media manager, but you have good ideas, please bring them to your person that manages your social media. Yeah. When I get tip tip offs or any form of interest is like the best thing that could possibly happen. People think maybe we don't wanna hear from them because we already have everything planned out or we're not interested, absolutely not true. For the love of God, <laughs> we need your help. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to quickly do a shout out to all the people watching our kind of guerrilla live stream. Um, thanks to Museum Nerd, who's here. We're, we also have uh, the Art Ropeg. We have Brooklyn Museum. We have Jaja at the Guggenheim, Rebecca Taylor at MoMA and PS1, as well as the Waterford Museum and Pahida. An artist, Dylan Kinnett from the Walter Museum and the Waterford is in Dublin. So All right. just, you know, a nice shout out to how we've um, managed through a simple Google Hangout patch in to bring this conversation out to a wider audience without really having to do much. Thanks to the future of technology. <laughs> Could you respond to the cat question? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I know you're all cat ladies. Where is it? Yeah. Being a cat lady or being a muse social? No, which gave her? Thanks, Jaja. <laughs> I'll take that one. Yeah. Jaja is secretly the leader of the internet cat lady mafia. I'm just blowing up her spot right now. I think one goes hand in hand with the other. <laughs> I also have a dog, full disclosure. <laughs> but actually, in all seriousness, we're really working hard to get away from cats. <laughs> Um, <laughs> not <in> our personal <laughs> lives, <but. Yeah>. professionally. <laughs> um, any other questions? Online questions? See any others? I thought, yeah. Actually, I was going to ask you all, um, when you're working with a curator, when you're working with education staff who don't even know what Twitter is, how do you sit down with them at the beginning of an exhibitions planning meeting and say, oh, I, I'd love to solicit your ideas for social media. It's like that, you know, if you go to the doctor, you're supposed to ask them, 
questions and be like, well, I don't know how my body works. Right. <laughs> about it. So how do you deal with that? Well, well I basically... Do you want to restate the question? I'm sorry, yes. So the question is, how do you initiate the conversation about social media with people who may not have any idea what social media is or how it's um, used? namely curators or educators or non-social media professionals in your museum. Um, basically what I do is I just listen. I stop and I listen. I say, you know, I say, what, what are your goals for this exhibition? What are the main key touch points? What really, um, what are you really trying to convey? And then we sort of, then I sort of come at it from a, like, um, a wider to a smaller perspective. They, they understand the blog very well, um, incidentally. So I then talk about, well, what might be interesting subjects or aspects of an exhibition that might be useful for a blog post? And then that conversation starts to bring it a little bit out of the academic and more into the popular uh, or populist uh, realm. And then we sort of start talking about, well, you just sort of open up the conversation and just sort of break it out into a more colloquial format. And then you know, I start kicking in with, well, oh, well, maybe this, you know, when is that person's birthday or what, you know, um, did they know this person or just sort of thinking about cool popular culture references and just sort of trying to contextualize the exhibition in a much larger format than, than solely how it's going to be displayed in the museum. And then it's interesting because they start sort of coming out with these really fabulous tidbits. I mean, as I said, curators research subjects to the nth degree, so they know all of the weird, obscure minutia about a particular subject that may not be included in the exhibition, but if you get them talking about it and get them sort of opening up about their research, you may pick up on something that they're not going to include in the exhibition and be like, that's perfect for social media. Let's grab that and do something cool with that. So, again, it's really just initiating the dialogue. And um, and I don't, you know, I don't isolate things and be like, I'm going to tweet that or that will go on Facebook. It's more just like, okay, well, we'll do a blog post about this and then that obviously will go out on social media and, oh, this is a really interesting nugget. I think it's not maybe enough for a blog post, but definitely enough for some sort of social media post and, oh, that's a really great photo. Maybe we could do a Tumblr piece there kind of thing. So you really just have to get the conversation going and sort of, and, and don't maybe constrain it so specifically to social media, because those are maybe scary words for people, and just sort of say, hey, I want to hear about the exhibition and find out how I can help you and, and help support you. Yeah, I've set up meetings with every department, just, what did I call it, Ig? I used your like doctor terminology too. I was like, a hey. something about your like digital health, like evaluation, <laughs> right. kind of like to see what they do personally and if they're using it professionally, kind of, and what are their needs and how can I help? How can I help? Like what tools do you, what do you wish you could do? Because maybe there's something that already does it. Um, and so based on that, it, conversations can come out of that, that continue. And I, um, I've done like specific like Instagram tutorials um, or mobile photography tutorials um, just for those interested you know, all staff emails, I've gotten over my shyness about that. So, you know, you find the folks who are into it. So a question coming from the internet, um, from uh, the Children's Museum. As a children's museum, we wanted to use Tumblr, but we're concerned about the abundance of adult content. Is this a problem for you? Um, mm, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, any of you guys want to take the lead on this? I just I feel have a like, funny story to share. Okay, Nothing okay. really. <laughs> um, I feel like it could have been a problem had we not, if, if it was like we were promoting all uses of Tumblr by using Tumblr, which I don't think we are. Um, we have, I, maybe this comes from a um, person who hasn't set up their own account on Tumblr. It's me. Oh, it's you. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to elaborate? Oh, yeah. I'm from the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. And um, I do have my own Tumblr, too. I love Tumblr. But it's all of the, like, FBA this and FBA that, and then you go off one click, and there's naked things. And so we just, like, as a children's museum, we want to be very, like, you know, you know we're more so than an art museum. I want to make sure that we're yeah. all clear with that, that, like, two clicks later, two clicks later that, you know, you're not running into this stuff. So I didn't know if you ever accidentally had an issue with that. I have a great story, actually. <laughs> So <laughs> obviously with Tumblr, you have a lot of themes to choose from. Um, if you get one that's canned, it looks kind of canned. So I had taken a theme and then changed a lot of it around for SF Moments Tumblr, and obviously had taken it from somebody's template. Um, and then 
you know, it was all looked good, everything smooth. And then maybe like three months after I launched our Tumblr, I get this weird email where someone's like, did you know that the button at the bottom of your Tumblr goes to a porn site? And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, it did. <laughs> so, but it was this tiny, tiny, tiny button um, that said DN. You know, it looks sort of like a graphic theme, like this Tumblr theme created by a DN. Turns out DN stands for Das Nasty. Um, yes. So luckily it was brought to our attention and we were able to solve the problem before anybody else hopefully saw it. And I mean, this just goes to a greater risk with the internet. The internet is like, it's the wild west out there. Um, and we have to just be realistic. If you think that it's a significant concern for your the people who would be following you there and that they would blame you for the, the weirdness of Tumblr, maybe don't do it. But I think most people are, you know, they've come to terms with the fact that you go online, you're going to see some weird stuff. Um, don't let your kids see it. If you, maybe it's like with TV, don't let them go wild on Tumblr. <laughs> do you guys want to add anything? Your story? My story is just, we have a Rudolf Nureyev um, exhibition up right now at the De Young, and I just encourage you all to type in the hashtag Nureyev on Tumblr, and that will illustrate your point perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> the end. <laughs> all right, it looks like we have one minute left. Any last minute questions? Any last minute questions? Okay, thank you all for attending, and if you um, have any additional thoughts, add them to the tag, and we'll be aggregating it later in a storefy.